We're going to jump into this parable. Today we're going to be in Luke chapter 15. I like the tendency of walking, so if I get out in front of the camera, just yell at me and tell me to get back in front of it. It's just that that's the way that I'm used to it. But in this parable, in Luke chapter 15, there's three uh, parables that are in it. They're talking about, and they all have to deal with the same topic of a being lost. But we're going to look at the first two today. I'm thinking Kurt probably is going to cover up the prodigal son. I'm kind of glad he did, and when I was studying it, I was like, man, there's a lot in these first two parables. We read them so fast sometimes that we miss a lot of the important stuff that's in it. So let's dive right into it, and we'll get really going into it. Luke chapter 15, 1 through 2, and actually the notes that are in the, the Faith app will work really well. Uh, Kurt sent me his notes, and you'll be blessed to know that he did a pretty good job on his notes, <laughs> at least I thought so. And we were, we were tracking both along the same way and on the same thing, so it's kind of cool to, to see that. Luke 15, 1 through 2, it says, now the tax collectors and sinners, now let me stop right there real quick. Did you, did you guys really see what's being said? Now the tax collectors and the sinners. They separate these two people, but right? Are we all not sinners? The Bible says that we all have sinned, but yet they separate these tax collectors. And I want you guys to just take a second and understand where the tax collector actually comes from. We look at it. Most of us know that they were really good at stealing money, right? So maybe the Roman government would say, charge them $20. They might charge you 50 bucks, right? Something similar to that. But let me tell you what they really do, because I was curious when they came up with that word and was looking at it, why, why do they always separate tax collectors? Do you guys realize that the tax collectors, most of them were Jewish. Think about Matthew in his own right, right? They sell their lives in order to, to be part of that Roman government. So they're saying, we're supporting you with everything that we do. Not only that, but then you think how mean and how uh, the torture that the Roman soldiers were really good at doing. They did it all the time. And so when you become a tax collector, that's what you become. So when you see that in the Bible, always stop for a second and think about it. We all can fall under these, these, this, the word sinners, but when we look at tax collectors, these are really heinous people. They're more than just stealing. They're more than just robbing. They're actually becoming part of those, those crucifixions. You remember in the story of Paul where they used to lie in the street, they would crucifix or crucify Christians and then use them for lamp lights all the way out the city. And there were miles and miles of it. So when you see that, pay attention to that. And let me continue. Well, and also with these sinners, when we're looking at sinners in this context, it's not just like you and I, because we're going to get to it when we start talking about who were, who were there amongst these people. The sinners that they're talking about, these are people that the Sadducees and the Pharisees had deemed unworthy. They were usually deformed because they found back then if uh, uh, they found that if a child, they would take a child and break its back, that they could use it to get more money out of people, to do crazy things. I, when I was reading this, I go, man, this is really just really bad. So when he's separating these parts, these were the people that were following Jesus. And we read it. It says, now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. We're talking about Jesus in this case. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes had grumbled saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. Now there's a lot, again, that goes into that. When it says that we eat, so then when we, when we stop with it, you think about Zacchaeus, you think about all these other people that Jesus had actually stopped and sat down and broke bread with and ate with. That means that in the, the Jewish tradition in the old times, that meant that you were agreeing with them. Now, we, we know that Jesus didn't agree with these sinners, the lifestyles that they were, but there was something that Jesus was saying that these sinners and tax players or tax collectors were actually interested in hearing what he had to say. They wouldn't have been following him around. You ever been in a small group Bible study and you go, why does so-and-so always keep coming back to this small group? Well, you know what? Maybe something that your group is saying is attracted to them that they're, they're wanting to find out more. In prison, I'm teaching a class called Experiencing God. And in the class, I never knew this guy. He's following me from class to class. But the last week, he told me he was an atheist. And I go, why do you want to be, an atheist? Why do you want to be in, in a class called Experiencing God of all things? He goes, Marty, I see what, what you bring in here when you come into the prison. I see what some of these other inmates are bringing and they're, how they're happy and they're joyous because, well, you're in prison. What fun could there be in there? What joy can you have? But their joy is not rooted in the worldly things. It's rooted in the Jesus Christ that we know. So he said, I want some of that. And I was like, wait a minute. You're an atheist. See, this is what confuses me. You're an atheist that don't believe in what I believe in, but you want some of what I got. <laughs> so I'm going, 
I'm telling them it's easy, just turn your life over to God. But these are the people that are following behind Jesus. These are the people that they're coming behind him and they want to hear him. Yet on the other side of the street, you got the religious folks looking down and how pious that they are, that these people, they're not worthy of it. They've already deemed it by law. These people aren't worthy. So we're not even going to share the gospel with them. We're not even going to share the law with them. And I was like, man, this is kind of, these guys are harsh. When you really look at these uh, Pharisees and the scribes, they did it. But also when you think about this, when you hear that word grumbled, you can go back and you think in the Old Testament, what else? Because Kurt likes taking us back to the Old Testament, right? What should stand out right away? Moses. Now he had people that were so excited to follow him, right? They were all throwing a party every day behind him. No, they grumbled over and over and over again. And you keep on thinking about the different things that they did. But, you know, the, looter, the leaders are grumbling against Jesus Christ. At the same time, you've got these sinners that are publicly hanging out with, with Jesus. They want to know him. They're sinful. They're, these guys are bad. So we do it. The man receives the sinners and he eats with them. Jesus did that. He didn't turn away any of these people. And we think about where we're at as a church. You think about some of the other churches in the community we have a tendency of crucifying the sick, do we not? The people that sin, maybe uh, people that are living out of wedlock. We want to crucify them and chase them out of the church. But what did Jesus do? Brought them closer. See, if we believe in Jesus Christ and we have that light inside us, should we not want to be around those type of people to share that with them? God gave us the greatest gift that could ever be given. And I, and I look out here and I know most of us has received that. What do you do at Christmas time when you get a gift? Keep it? Hide it? No. What happens if it's one of those ones that you've been wanting forever? You get it. Post it on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, every social media spot you possibly can, right? Telling everybody what you got. Do we do the same thing with Jesus Christ? And what do we do with that prize or that gift? We keep it close to us. We don't push it away. We don't keep it at, we don't just put it over there on the shelf and let nobody ever get near it. No, every time somebody comes over the house, come here, look at this. Am I lying? We all got those possessions, the guys that ride motorcycles. <laughs> look at my bike, it's pretty cool. And all the people that play sports, you know, you got that, that famous memorabilia that you always want to hold on to. So there is a Greek word in here. It was prodekmia. Prodekmia is what it was called. It was what Kurt, I actually used the program and actually had to say, but the, they got that throaty stuff that I can't do. I'm telling you, I have a tough enough time with English. So if you're going to come in here for a Greek and Hebrew lesson today, it ain't happening. I'll try and do the best I can. But that word in there that receive, it means to welcome, to look forward to. Are we like that with the people that we come into, the people that we know? How about this? Are we even that way with other Christians? Or are you kind of like, Kurt talked about a while back when you go into Walmart, you find that black aisle lane. And it was funny because when he was talking about it, I don't know if you guys know Mr. Byerly. I love him to death. But I just, we were looking at him. He likes to talk, okay? And we were not in a talk of the movie. And I asked Janet, is that Mr. Byerly? She's like, I think so. I said, well, let's go over here. So we went over in the far part of the Goodwill section nobody likes going into. And lo and behold, he's right there. And Janet goes, hey, aren't you Mr. Byerly? I was like, oh, so I was like, man, so I, I don't always do that welcoming. So I'm not sitting here saying for me, telling everybody to do it. We all have those times that we just, sometimes we like to be left alone and we want to do it, but we need to be able to sh be ready and in and out of season to share the gospel with other people. And you know what? We ended up talking with them. You know what? It wasn't as bad as I created it out to be. And it was a blessing because I used to teach a Sunday school class that he was in. And it was funny. We talked a lot about the memories of that. So we need to be able to do that, you know, and, and when you think about these sinners and stuff too, there's some wisdom in us choosing our friends, okay? I'm not telling you, notice Jesus didn't just go out, hang out with them in to do it, and I don't know if any of y'all have ever been guilty of it, but, well, I'm going to hang around with that person or this person because I want to tell them about Christ. What well, usually happens? Do we not take on the bad properties of them? And it usually has that reverse effect. Well, Jesus, understand he's not finding He's not saying, oh, what you guys are doing is okay. No, he's going in there with intentions of being able to change their hearts and change their minds and change the way that they were living because those things, sometimes they were very unacceptable. 
Instead, you know, it, it, our, this was pretty interesting. Time spent with sinners was part of a mission to spread the good news to all people. That was Jesus's. Churches today should be an oasis in the jungle of sinners for all notorious types. We shouldn't turn away anybody. Instead, they often care only for the clean shaven and the, and the well healed, if you think about that. And I hate to say that, but sometimes that's true. What I really love about our church is we're trying to do things differently. When homeless people come in, we accept them. They're not clean. They're not that. It's okay. We don't sit there and go, Psh, get out of here. Be quiet. Sit in the back. No. Matter of fact, bring your dog in because John likes cleaning up dog hair afterwards. Right? <laughs> so we got that. So now that's only two verses into it. And I still got a lot more time. No, I'm just kidding. You think Kurt could talk. But sometimes when we read that parable, if you don't understand the pre, uh, the pre part of it, this context where it's written at. And if you actually go back into chapter 14, you'll see why the Pharisees were a little bit upset with Jesus. But Jesus is fixing to get a little bit ugly with these guys in, in a way. So the last thing it says, this man eats, receives sinners and eats with them. In verse three, as we go on, let's get into the parable of the sheep. He said, so he told them a parable. Notice Jesus didn't address anything that them grumbling guys were doing. What does he do? He likes to make things difficult sometimes, not only for us, but for the, the people who are there. He tells them a parable. He said, what man of you having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoicing. A good shepherd, his responsibility is keeping those sheep safe and secure. Don't think that shepherds, they usually kind of flock together too. There was usually three or four different groups when I was reading and studying about it. Because when I read that before, I was going, man, that's kind of foolish to leave 99 sheep. We all determined that sheep are kind of crazy. And when left alone, they kind of do their own thing and they're going to wander off, right? So do you think he leaves those 99 just out in the middle of the field and goes, now sheep, you all stay here. Don't go anywhere. Don't go do anything goofy because I got to go find your little buddy that got lost. No, he left it in good hands. It's like when, when our pastor can leave, we get left in good hands as well and the different things. So he, he left them safe and cure. He was willing to leave after him just to go get that one lost in the danger. And we have to think about that, the shepherd, regardless, for his own safety. Sheep are, are really, really good at wandering off. I was reading it and it said, my question was, how come sheep always get lost? We determine that they're dumb. Jesus calls us sheep, so in a roundabout way, we have it, but you think about it in our own lives. Is it the big things that run us off? No, says, it, the, the, I was reading something that a shepherd wrote. He said, sheeps tend to drift off, but what they do is they do it nibble by nibble. So they'll eat a little tuft of grass, you know what? And they see another little tuft over there. Next thing you know, they're over there eating that. And the next thing you know, there's another one. Next thing you're close to the fence. Well, there's a hole in the fence. No, nah, look at that grass. It looks good. And the next thing you know, it's wandered off. And then it, the thing that's interesting says the sheep doesn't really remember how to get its way back. You would have figured they would have left a trail or something, breadcrumbs. Come on, man. How big is this field? But then they can't find the hole to get back in the fence. And then the sheep just, so what does it do? It, it starts fleeing because it's scared and it takes off. Found out sheep were, uh, they're very skittish creatures. Not only are we dumb, but we're skittish too. Big sounds happen. We all get afraid. That'll, it said that that'll startle the sheep. But the cool thing that is, is when he finds it, the shepherd finds it. You ever go, do you ever let your dog get out of the yard and he's lost for a couple days? Now, some of y'all don't want to know the answer to, but you probably beat that dog. Where you been for the last three days? And you're all worried about it and everything else. No, what does this shepherd do? It lays it, it picks it up and brings it back and lays it up on its shoulders and carries it around. How cool is that? Think about it in our lives when we wander off the little sins that we commit, that we think that aren't that big. We commit a little one, a little one, a little one. Next thing you know, there's no repentance in it. And the next thing, we're way off. And all you got is your father just going, come on back. I got this. Come back. And when we don't come back, he goes out and gets us. And how many times has he picked us up and put us on our shoulders and carried us back into the fold? And whatever you did, it's not as bad as you thought it was. Jesus didn't beat the sheep. The shepherd didn't beat the sheep. No, he put it back in with the flock. And you know what I thought was the most amazing part of it? And then I left this out. And so when he found it, what did he do? He lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. 
So not only did he go out, find that sheep, put it up on his shoulders, but he was rejoicing. He was, he was excited that he found that lost sheep. As we do it, as we're straying out, every time we repent, Christ rejoices because we're sitting there, we're, going, we're coming closer to him. Remember how Kurt always talks about God sits at the right hand of the Father and we get to be sitting in that right hand seat. How cool is that? How many of us actually take God up on that and get to go cuddle up in it? Or do you think that you're not worthy? But let's look at this next thing. When the rejoicing, out of these parables, when I first started, I thought lost was the theme. But what I came to find out as I was studying these people, I noticed that the, the rejoicing part, the being excited part about it is. So when we get a sinner that comes off the streets, somebody that doesn't know Christ and they accept God, what do we do? We should have a big party, should we not? We should be rejoicing, but most of the time churches will get it going. That's pretty cool. Give him a week, he'll be back to where he was. I mean, Al works in the, the recovery type thing and doing things like that. Sometimes that's what you think. But you know what? We rejoice. Somebody comes out the street and they want to get themselves right. Man, we should be so excited to want to share the gospel with these guys. We want to throw them up on our shoulders and take care of them and teach them the way that they're supposed to be. All they're learning, that we don't know where they came from. So we don't know what the background is. And we're, re we're writing a story for them that that's not even, we're not even worthy of living. Yet we want to share the gospel. All you need is a little Jesus. You know, sometimes it takes it on our behalf for us to be able to go out and search for those type of people. So we need to be a kind of a church that does it. Uh, you see the uh, stark contrast. You see grumbling Sadducees and Pharisees on this one hand. Yet on the other hand, you see our Christ that's rejoicing because one person who was lost, the shepherd heart that they have, and we need to be able to do it. You got on the other hand, these guys that are angry because sinners are wanting to come in and know the kingdom and these guys are angry because, well, now we're going to have to tell them about it. We're going to have to, have to do what we do. Those guys should have been the leaders that should have been intermingled in between those guys, helping them, but they weren't. They were grumbling. They were upset with Jesus. But the shepherd, he finds it's joyful in everything that he found by that lost sheep. And that's the way Christ does it. As we read on, let's see what happens next. Because not only did he rejoice, but in verse 6 and 7, it goes on and says, it says, and when he comes home, what did he do? He calls together his friends, his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, and this here is the last verses for the, the grumbling people. So I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents, over the 99 righteous persons who needs no repentance. And it's not that they didn't need repentance. It's just that they didn't seek it. They thought that they didn't. So please never get so comfortable in your walk with Christ that you don't need repentance because then you're elevating yourself to a, a Pharisee status. Then you're going to be grumbling when you come into church trying to find fault with everything. But yet, what did he do? The shepherd called who? His friends? His neighbors? We could go down that hole with the neighbors. Who's your neighbor? Is it just the people that live across the street from you? Is it the ones that uh, live side by side to you? God challenge you to go look that up and dig it in the Word. There's a word called all, and no matter how it's said in Greek or Hebrew, all means all. That's everybody that you come in contact with. Saying with them, rejoice with me, for I've found that sheep. Do we do that when we, when, we lead, when we have the opportunity that Christ allows us to be a part of that perfect plan that we're leading somebody to Christ? Do we surround them with other brothers and sisters? Or do you just take a notch and go, look, saved another one. We don't save anybody. And I think that's sometimes where we get complicated. Why would I want to share the gospel with everybody if I have to save them? And then now I've got to disciple them and then baptize them and do all these other things with them. <clears throat> this is a lifestyle change, people. This is a lifelong journey that we're going to be taking. And it's, you know what the cool thing is, is you don't have to take one step and you're done. We get to keep walking it through. There's a sanctification process. I sometimes... I know I'm not worthy to stand up here and preach God's word. I'm not worthy to go into prison and share, share the gospel. But Christ says, go, I go. We have to be obedient to it. If you guys, some of y'all know me a little bit longer than I've been here, and some of you don't, but when I tell my friends I'm going into prison, one of the funniest things that I always hear back out, what you guys would think was, 
oh, that's awesome, Marty. No, they don't say that. They go, they let you out. <laughs> so we all have that shady past, okay? <laughs> My friends go, I go, these people here don't know me like you guys do. You didn't grow up with me in high school and let me do all the crazy things. But I, I love the, the thing. And another thing it says in here what Jesus had said, there will be more joy in heaven. And then the next one, as we get to read on a little bit more, as we look at the lost coin, we're going to find out who is doing the rejoicing. Sometimes we get that confused in who and doing it. If hell, hell, heaven celebrates repentance, what, would, what would should we do when a sinner repents? We just kind of just, it's not a big deal. Repentance to me is one of the best gifts God ever gave us. It's kind of a, the world won't give you that. The world won't give you that eraser that says, what you did, I forgive you for it. And, and you know what? I'm never going to hold it against you again. When we do something wrong, especially if you're at work and you get a review every year, right? On January 1st, right? The new year rolls over, you do something bad. And then you don't do anything bad the rest of the year. In your review, what happens? What you did on January 2nd when you went back to work, that bad thing. Is it not true? But you know what, Christ, if you asked him for repentance, when we stand there before him, he's going to see a white, there's, your, there's all the things that you've done wrong. Just a clear piece of paper, a white sheet. And that's, that's the most amazing thing. He never holds that against us. He goes, well, last week you said the same thing. No, Christ doesn't do that against us. He rejoices, as we should rejoice when we see other people repentance. Again, as I said before, repentance is, to me, is one of the greatest gifts. It's not a, it's not a chance to, to redo something or go back over it because how many times it said, Lord, get me through this. This is the last time I'll ever do it. I promise, I promise. What are we doing the week after? Same thing. And then we get it through that again. Lord, forgive me. God goes, okay. And we're back at it again and again. And until that true repentance, until there's that heart change, when we finally say, I'm done. Look, God, I don't want to do that anymore. It's not only hurting me, but it's hurting my family. Not only is it hurting my family, but it's hurting my neighbors, my friends next to me, and everything. Sin has a way of just, it's very cancerous, and it runs rampant. And if you don't get hold of it, and you don't do that repentance, and we don't do it, that's why I think that that celebration, the rejoicing part of these parables is important. When you repent, if your spouse tells you something, don't, don't be it forever and hold it against them. Rejoice. Because that's gone. It should be gone. And don't go back to it. That's why I think repentance is the greatest thing. It is turning away from something. But more importantly, it's turning back to God. Because when, if we need repentance, that means we're walking in the wrong direction. And we're doing something wrong. And we need to turn away from that. Say, I don't want that anymore. But I want God. And I want God. Only God. And the best part is you're not going to perfect it. And it's okay. He's going to come looking for you when you wander off again. He's going to throw you back up on your shoulders. And he's going to go, come on, get this right. And he's going to pat you on your head as a sheep, give us whatever sheep eat, and go on. <laughs> I don't know what they eat. <laughs> I, I guess everything, it seems like. But the 99 righteous persons that need no repentance, when we think about that, if we get so comfortable in our walk to think that we're never going to sin again, that we're never going to need that repentance that, that Christ offered for us. You're saying at that point, the sacrifice isn't good enough for you. When you try and do it on your own, you're still saying the sacrifice isn't good enough for you. Christ died on the cross once and for all. That was the end. He said it on the cross. It is finished. It's done. Nothing that you can do. So accept this gift that I'm giving you. I'm, I'm providing you a way out. I know you guys are going to mess up. But I'm giving you this gift. Turn back to me. It's okay. The blood that was spilled up there, it covers everything. The little sins, the big sins. But in, the, in fact, they're all sins. There is no little and big. They're all sins. They all, have, they all have consequences on it. And we need to be able to do it. And this is a kind of a dig. You know how Jesus likes to always dig at people, especially these guys that like to grumble and sitting on the side? The Pharisees really knew what he was talking about when he said this. They're like, huh. So if they didn't want to kill him from before in the previous chapter, here's a little bit more wood that he threw on the fire to be able to help him build that cross to get him there. <laughs> and that's, we do it. And then Jesus, what he's really saying is that those 99 people think they do not need that repentance. We all need repentance. We all make mistakes every day. 
I used to pray a prayer in the morning, and maybe you guys can steal this prayer as well. Lord, forgive me for all the sins I did. I know I did so many. I just can't remember them all. You ever get in a hurry like that with Christ? I think I was one of those lost sheep that he had to throw. He was Marty. So go ahead. what I did through this many years of walking through wisdom, I said, Lord, when I sin, because I know I'm going to, when I make that mistake, fix it right now. Let me be identified with it. Let me know it so I can ask for that repentance right away. But we, we all tend to not, we, we don't want to know that. We don't want it to be identified. You ever have, have a backpack? I always think of a backpack. Every time we sin, it was a five-pound rock. Then we sin again, we throw another five-pound rock. Well, that's not a lot. What happens when you keep throwing in more and more? Back, you get heavy at the end of the day, right? And then I want to throw that out there. Because I sin so much, I can't name them. But I want to—I want God to identify them in my lives. Why? Because maybe you're looking for that lost sheep, right? So we have to be open to that. You never know what God's got going through your lives. A little note that when I, sometimes when you study, God gives you these notes. Janet always goes, "Well, you, you're reading from your notes," but you—it's so good. No matter how you try and paraphrase it, it's not going to work, right? I wrote, the grumbling, the grumbling Pharisees wanted to demonstrate their disapproval of Jesus' actions, but Jesus didn't say a word in his own defense. Instead, he chose to speak these parables. The religious leaders were to picture themselves as shepherds. And in reality, as leaders of the nation, they should have been a, as serving as shepherds of God's people. And the big problem of modern, modern Christianity is that we allow people we look down on those that go astray, yet we forget where we came from. We all admitted that we, ha we need repentance in our lives. We all walk away and we're stray, right? Instead of, instead of throwing a rejoicing party. If we haven't seen somebody in church in a couple weeks that we're used to seeing, do we call them? Do we go out and seek them? Do we go out and, and wonder where they're at? Ah, oh, they're just out there on vacation, or they're out there doing this, or they're doing that. We make up excuses for them. We should be a church that loves people regardless of what they are doing or where they're at. God doesn't want us perfect first before we come to him. He wouldn't have had to die on the cross, would he? But instead, he accepts us. He says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How cool is that? To me, that's amazing, man. So if we really think about it today, are we not doing the opposite of what Jesus is telling us to do? Go grab somebody, rejoice when we bring them back into the fold. Well, they got jeans that are holy. How about this? Most of us are blessed. Why not buy that person a new pair of jeans? Well, in a new shirt. Kurt was talking about the storehouses, <laughs> right? How many of us have extra jeans that we could just give them right now? They're too big. They're too small. Well, we're making all these excuses. Why do we go to the negative right away? Maybe they can take that gene, buy something, sell it, come back with it, and buy the size that fits them. Right? We just we don't look at those things. So I think I beat that to death. Let's do better as a church, right? We, we need to be able to rejoice when somebody comes into these doors, especially if they don't know Christ. If we gain another brother on the team and, and our sister... Man, how awesome is that? But what about that person that walks in that needs it, that doesn't know Christ? We should throw a party. It should be like, man, the, the guns went off in here, glitter falls down like on, uh, what's that stupid show, the idol show? <laughs> you know, when they do it, we give them a golden buzzer and the glitter comes down. And man, that's the way we should be rejoicing for these people. So let's go on. Let's look about the coin. So you got to get the sheep thing. The sheep thing, and then I'll bring it a summary in the end here for you. The lost coin, verse 8 through 10, it says, Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek Dylan? Don't look at your spouse, because if she loses something and she turns your house upside down over this thing, it's not what this is, <laughs> this is about. And she seeks diligently until she finds it. And when she found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I found that coin I had lost. And then Jesus taking a jab again. So just so I tell you that there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. 
as the Pharisees are looking down at these sinners and the tax collectors and realizing or thinking that they're unworthy. They're not worthy of, of this love of the Messiah, right? Yeah, they have the Messiah right in the middle of them. And who, who's, whose ear is being lent to it? And in this lost coin, those 10 silver coins, think about the cost of it is. It's a day's labor. How would you like to work all day and your boss come in and go, I lost your check. What would you do? I ain't coming back tomorrow. <laughs> do you pay me for today? It wasn't an option. Wouldn't you help him tear up everything, finding that? Flip over his office, try and find that check or whatever it was. I mean, maybe just write another check. It'll be good. But back then they had these coins. So it was equal to an entire day's wages. And back then they used to get paid for what they did each day. It's not like, like we are where we get two weeks pay or if you get paid in a month. For this woman, this is an emergency. You're going, it's just a coin. I remember when I was dating Janet before we got married uh, she's one of them financial wizards, and she was balancing her checkbook, and she was 10 cents off, and I'm like, man, it's only a dime, let's go, you know? So I took a quarter and tossed it at her. <laughs> quarter come flying back at me with a little more velocity than when I threw it at her. It's 10 cents, I gotta find it. I was like, woo. I was, I was like, man, what kind of craziness am I getting myself into? No, I'm just joking, babe. You know I love you. <laughs> But you are crazy. But, but we have this thing. But to the person that lost it, us looking from the outside, we don't know what the value is, do we? So we just kind of write, it's only, it's only, it's one of 10 coins. It's okay. You still got nine. Trying to look at the positive side of it. But this lady, she's willing, she searched diligently. It said she lit a lamp. One, that cost money because back then they had to use the oil to do it. Swept the house. Well, that's not a bad thing because sometimes we all can use some of that, right? And it, then, But then it says she seeked diligently until she finds it. She saw it. She sought out that coin. It was that important that she found that coin. Do we do that? When we lose something, do we do that for our friends that are lost? I know we usually... The church cliche thing is, is says, well, let's pray for so-and-so. Or how about this? Everybody write down a name on a piece of paper and you pray for that person. Do you guys ever do anything more than just praying? Do you go out and seek that person? Do you invite them to dinner? Do you invite them over to your house maybe to watch a football game? Or whatever kind of sports that they're into. Do you invite them out fishing or hunting where you guys, a lot of us like to go? And the different things like that. That's, what, that's the way we need to do that with this loss. And you sit there and go, it's only, but, there's, but and there's 50 people that come in here. Yeah, but to that one loss, somebody in here, that person has to have value to them. And we need to do, rejoice in them because it goes on. What does it say? So I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So who's doing the repenting? I mean, who's doing the rejoicing? There's a Greek word for the word before and just what it means in front of or in the sight of. I'm not even going to try that word because I didn't look it up. And it's got way more vowels in it than I'm used to having. But it means that the angels are not doing the rejoicing, but are witnessing the rejoicing. But God is doing the rejoicing. See, the maker of the heavens and the earth loves you that much that when you're lost, sends the shepherd out to go get you or he'll go out and get you. To bring you back into that fold. Again, the context, the maker of the heavens and the earth. But can he just create another one of us? Can another one of us just be made? Or do you not see the value in you that God created? And maybe you're not rejoicing about that. But God created each and every one of us for a purpose. And why do we attend here? Because of the gifts that we, each one of us, have. I might have... Ten, nine, or nine of ten coins, but without that ten coin, I'm not complete, am I? So I may have some spiritual gifts that I can use. You guys have spiritual gifts that you can use. And all together, we have a lot more spiritual gifts than any one individual in this room, do we not? So we're all the same. Some of you guys are way better at emphasizing than I am. Some of you guys are better at speaking than I am. Some of you guys are better at sharing and giving. And all these things, but together as a family, I think we do very well. 
again, to just listen and not have financial problems in a church, and you see all these other churches worried about where their next penny's coming from, how are we going to be able to pay the pastor? I went to a church like that. That's how I really come to know Christ. Um, the pastor, we were in a small group and just started going to the church, loved it. And a pastor comes in on our small group. I got some bad news. He said, unless we get some financial assistance or somebody comes up with some money or something, the church only is going to be able to exist for two more weeks. And I was like, wait a minute, you can't, no, that can't happen. I just found church. I found God. I found a family that I loved being with. And they rejoiced as a crazy lost person that I was that came into their group. So we prayed that night. And then God likes to do what God likes to do. A week later, he'd come back in and he was rejoicing. But he got to share the opportunity. Somebody came in and paid the bills for two years in the church, his salary and everything. And I was like, man, okay, I, I got to find out more about this God. Because if he can answer prayers that quick and he can do miracles like that, he can do that in my life. And at that time, I had just quit drinking and was still struggling with things. I was the one that these Pharisees would look at and said I was unworthy. Still have people saying that, but it's okay. Because you know what? Their opinion doesn't matter anymore. Only God's does. So we, we walk through that, the different things. And Christ, remember, God is the one doing it. It's not the angels. The angels get to join in on it. But they're not the one that's throwing the party. They're not the one that's sitting at the head of the table. That one person that came back. So that name that you've written down, you probably have in your Bible somewhere that you may still be praying for. I, I challenge you to put it into action. Go out and seek that person this week, okay? Go out there and dig for them for it. There's a passage in Hebrews uh, chapter 2, verse 11 and 12, and it says, He who sanctifies... And those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers. Saying, I will tell you, I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation and I will sing your praise. That's Christ bragging about us amongst his people. How cool is that? You, you never think that your name is called out? It is. It's written in the book of life. We've been studying Revelation where we're going to get to spend eternity. Right? Are you not excited about that? We should be overly enthusiastic about that. But you know what? The, uh, we should be able to take other people with us. Somebody told me one time that there was one thing worse than going to hell and one thing better than going to heaven. And we know the heaven thing, so we're not going to dig down that. That's what he said, not me. But the fact of the matter was, was taking somebody with you. In these parables of this lost sheep, who is that lost sheep to you? And when you think about this and this, this lost sheep, right? Why did the sheep get lost? Was it just because he was dumb? No, it was something that he did. It was his fault. He chose to walk off and nibble or she walk off and nibble and follow that path down there. What about the coin? The coin didn't just go lose itself. Sometimes we like to think that. In our houses, some of us have smaller houses. How can you lose anything in a house that small? Well, the coin decided to lose itself. No, maybe it's because we were careless with that coin. We didn't take care of it the way we should have been. What are you going to do about that? Both of these things, again, they, they describe things that are lost, a sheep and in a coin. A question I have for you guys, over the last year, has anything been lost in your walk with God? God's wanting to restore it. He's wanting to give it back. And better yet, he's wanting to rejoice over it with you. Sheep get lost by being distracted and wandering off. How many times in our walk have we been distracted and wandered off that path? And Christ had grace and mercy and he poured it back on us and said, come on back. I've done crazy things. Sometimes in church, things probably should be excommunicated from, but people love you. God loves me even more. So shouldn't we love those same people? Somebody told me one time with a lot more wisdom than I ever had, and he goes, Marty, when you're making fun of or you're picking on somebody that's God's creation, even in particular the lost, 
are you not making fun of, of God? And I was like, well, how's that? They're not God. Why well, are we not created in the image of God? Should we not bear that likeness of Christ? But yeah, we want to be able to poke fun at people. We want to make fun of that, lift ourselves up, make us feel better, make our prides be boost, boasted or, or boosted up, whatever you want to call it. I don't ever claim to be an English major. They give me a microphone, I get to make words up. You get to go home and tell your kids they're not real words. It's okay. It'll be okay, I promise you. So uh, we have that thing. So the coins are lost through carelessness. Again, the question when I was studying this, how have I grown careless in my walk with God? I challenge you guys to, to, to just take those thoughts. So how can we, this was cool. This was something that God gave me when I was studying. You can tell the value of something by how far you were willing to go to retrieve what you lose. Am I right? Some of us could lose a gun, and it ain't nothing but a thing. But to a hunter, their prized gun that shot it, maybe their first deer was. You'll go a long time looking to get that gun back, will you not? We got to think about things like that. So how can we make this uh, applicable to our lives? If you wandered off, if you didn't like the sheep did, it's okay. Repent and be forgiven. Come back. Let us all be able to join into that thing. So if you're struggling with that, it's simple. Here's another way that we do. We, we need to rejoice. We need to celebrate over everyone who repents. So if you wandered off, you repented. One of us, there's some big guys in here. We can all throw you up on our shoulders, carry you back, and we can have a party. We can celebrate. We can rejoice. We, God wants us to join in with it. And then most of all, it says in here, one of the things that I was like this, the more and more that we do our walk, that we don't realize it, but I'm going to tell you as parents, as students, as leaders in this community, as some of you guys are business owners, and all these other different places that we go through, people are watching you. They know that you go to church. They know that you say that you're a Christian. So we better be more like Jesus because if you want your employees to be more like you, should we not be more like Christ? If you want your kids to be more like you, they're going to be regardless. Don't you want to be more like Christ to be able to give them that thing? There's a song, uh, I think it's Finding Favor sings it, Be Like You. And when I heard it the first time, it broke my heart because as a father, I've messed up. I wasn't always a good example of Christ. But God gives you that, that opportunity to fix what you broke. I can't get back that lost time, but I was able to give them Christ in a way that they never were able to do it. They're excited when their dad goes to prison, and even more so when I get to come out, you know. So we do things like that, but the thing that I want you guys to, to get, let's be more like Jesus. We need to seek out that loss. So that name that you wrote down in your Bible, I challenge you this week, do more with it. Or the name that God's putting on your heart right now that you know of somebody that's lost, Go out and seek that person. Bring them in. Let us. And then when they come in and they repent, bring them into the family and let us rejoice. Tell everybody about that person. And let us all surround it. That's that. You want to know what the true thing is when we say the Great Commission? That's part of that Great Commission. That's part of being a disciple. That's part of discipleship. That's part of being that, that baptizing and that baptisma of the word that it uses. We need to submerge them in an environment like this. So can we all agree we need to be more like Jesus? Am I speaking to the right people? I think so. I'm, I'm included. And I'm not just saying you all. You all be like Jesus. I don't have to be like Jesus. No, if I'm going to stand up here and I'm going to preach God's word and I'm going to confess his name and I'm going to take on the image of Christ and bear his name, I better do it the best that I can while I'm out there. Am I going to make mistakes? Yep. I guarantee it. But the people are watching what I do when I make those mistakes. Do you stay down? Do you waddle in it? Do you stay out there in the lost? And those that do, as we see our, some of our people stumble and fall, you're accountable to help keeping them on the right path. We need to be the ones going out and seeking them. Y'all with me? So we need to be more like Jesus. Say it. I want to be more like Jesus. Come on. Oh, just one or two of you guys. Now I know how Kurt feels. Let's try it again. I want to be more like Jesus. And that's easy. We can confess it. Now the challenge is taking it outside these walls and living it. We're going to close in a song. We'll have a song and then I'll come up and pray us out. 
we're going to sing Waymaker again. And you guys did an amazing job singing. I want to let you know. And I know how difficult it is. We're used to having all these bells and whistles. But the cool thing was, is we didn't, since we didn't have these, it didn't stop us. And that's what God wanted us to push through it. I was, got the text later last night. Oh, what are we supposed to do? We'll do a video. It'll be okay. Well, videos are not as exciting. But you know what? It was exciting to me as I was standing back there. I heard you all singing. So if Jesus is your way maker, let him know. Sing it out. Is he your peacekeeper? Is he everything into you? So as we do, don't forget, we got the communion cups up here. Grab those. But let's sing this song in closing, and then I'll come up and pray.